Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa I am deeply honored that I was invited to give this keynote address for the second international conference on Islamic civilization hosted by Pas Kasarjana Islamic University in Banda Aceh, Indonesia. Uh, I first want to congratulate all the participants, uh, the organizers, uh, and uh, the faculty and staff of the university uh, for organizing such an important conference. And I'm uh, deeply honored uh, to be invited to give an address in the company of such an audience roster that you have uh, successfully invited to your conference. Uh, what I will be doing today essentially is rather than just delivering a paper on the subject uh, of Ihsan, I'm going to try and summarize uh, my book, which is titled Islam and Good Governance, A Political Philosophy of Ihsan. And what I will do today is essentially twofold uh, in trying to make the case that Ihsan can also be a philosophical foundation uh, for an Islamic state or a polity which seeks uh, to inform its public sphere by Islamic values. So what I really will be doing is essentially two things. Number one, I will discuss what is Ihsan and how I understand the concept uh, based on a comprehensive review of how Ihsan has been understood in Islamic sources, that is the Quran and the Hadith, and how Islamic Ihsan has also been understood uh, by various scholars in the past. Because of the shortness of time, I will not be able to fully uh, do justice to this review, but in my book I actually have two full chapters, one uh, uh, revo uh, reviewing everything that nearly every major scholar uh, uh, of Islam wrote about Ihsan, and then I also spend a whole chapter talking about how Ihsan is discussed in the Quran uh, and the corpus of Hadith. The second goal that I want to do is to unpack the concept of Ihsan and to advance a political philosophy of an Islamic state based on Ihsan. Uh, I will limit myself as part of the second goal uh, to do essentially two things to, to share just the framework of how I have unpacked uh, the Ihsan uh, that we find in the Quran as well as the Hadith uh, because in order for it to move away from being a, a cosmological idea to becoming a political philosophical idea. Uh, I had to make some transition and I will discuss that transition. Uh, by breaking Ihsan into different components, uh, I am able to argue how various elements of Ihsan can be implemented in public policy, at least in discussions of public policy. Uh, if it's quite possible that the enormous normative standards that Ahsan demands of individuals as well as uh, of uh, societies uh, may become something that most of the states may not be able to afford. So in that sense, this model becomes more of an aspirational model than something that can be implemented like this tomorrow. But the idea is to develop a benchmark of policies based on the virtues of Ahsan. Uh, and uh, and then be apologetic uh, or embarrassed when we depart from that benchmark. Uh, from the Quran, we understand Ihsan as essentially as doing something that is very beautiful. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, "Ahsanu inna Allaha yuhibul muhsinin." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Do Ihsan." Allah loves those who do Ihsan, and a lot of people, because of the root of the word Ihsan in the Quran, uh, from Husn, Hasana, uh, have argued that one way to translate uh, the word Ihsan, which usually is translated by English commentators as uh, pursuit of perfection or doing good deeds. Uh, doing good deeds is actually, uh, I think, uh, unfair to the concept of Ihsan because there is a lot of uh, uh, nuance and subtlety in the Quran. The Quran talks about al-bir, which is also a pursuit of virtue, uh, amal salihan good deeds. So just translating the word ihsan as either charity or doing good deeds uh, is, I think, uh, doing disservice to the idea of ihsan. It is better to talk, up, talk about it as pursuit of perfection or uh, performing deeds which are beautiful, whether in material sense or spiritual sense. The Quran also suggests that Ihsan 
uh, understood as seeking perfection in one's fitra is the purpose of creation. Uh, in the second ayah of Surat al muk Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says very clearly that he has created us uh, to do ihsan. And so to me, uh, what it means really is uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us uh, and to be like everything else in the nature, to to fulfill the purpose and potential of our fitra, which is to pursue ihsan. We may not achieve ihsan, but our life should be one that pursues ihsan. Uh, so that is uh, what I believe is uh, deeply uh, ingrained in the Quran. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually employs more than 70 verses which directly talk about uh, the importance of Ihsan. But from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we learn about the enormous mystical and philosophical uh, depth and scope of the idea of Ihsan. Two traditions are very important uh, here that I want to address. Number one is um, the Hadith of Jibreel, uh, in which uh, when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is asked by Jibreel uh, to describe what is Ihsan, uh, Rasulullah says um, that Ihsan is to worship Allah as if you see him, and if you cannot see him, know that he sees you. Now, the first time when I read it, 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 it was, I mean, either you can gloss over the idea of to worship Allah as if you see him, uh, and then focus on the other part and live the rest of your life as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking at you. But I realize that if you focus on the first part of the definition of Ihsan, is to live life as if uh, uh, you are seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a, a deep-seated desire for witnessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And since this hadith was revealed after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had gone on the journey of Miraj, when he did offer salah, when he did worship, it was indeed as if he had seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because according to the Quran, he did see some of the greatest of signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, but in public policy terms, it becomes very interesting. What does it mean to live life as if you're bearing witness uh, to the reality of God? The second hadith, which is also very important, is that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded uh, that we do ihsan in everything that we do. Kataba Allahu al ihsan ala kulli shay. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained ihsan in everything that we do. So, in fact, after I read this hadith, I, I thought uh, of writing a book on ihsan by asking the question if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded that we pursue ihsan in every aspect of our life then why not in politics? Uh, and so this is my effort. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive uh, all the mistakes that I might have made. And if there is any good in it, I hope he accepts it. And I hope that I provide uh, some thought uh, and some ideas uh, for you all as you think about implementing uh, Islamic values uh, in your university, in your society, in your public sphere. Now let me tell you how I unpacked the concept of Ihsan. Uh, so the way I understand the concept of Ihsan is that it has seven dimensions. The first one is of Mushahada. Uh, this is very important uh, because Ihsan is to worship Allah as if you see him. Or Ihsan, because the word Ta'budu can also be understood as to serve Allah then to serve Allah as if you see him. And uh, this idea of bearing witness is, is derived from here. It is very interesting because what the definition of Ihsan here says is that not only is Allah Ta'ala uh, witnessed, but he's also bearing witness because he's seeing us. So in that sense, uh, both we and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala are performing a very similar function we are bearing witness to his greatness and he is bearing witness to our deeds. Uh, 
Uh, and in that sense, to me, this is a perfect example of the other concept uh, or meaning of Ihsan, which is muhabba, which is love for God. So we are looking at God and he's looking at us. It reminds me of the dua of Musa al-Islam, Rabbi arini unzur kilay. Ya Allah, show me yourself so that I may gaze upon you. He was also seeking uh, to acquire the state of Ihsan, uh, where he could bear witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to see him, to make eye contact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I like to talk about it. So, so this is it. You're gazing at Allah, and Allah is gazing at you. So this is the first aspect of, uh, of Ihsan, to bear mushahada. The second aspect is rahma and compassion and mercy. Uh, uh, in fact, in the hadith where Allah, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has commanded that we do things beautifully, no matter what we do. In the later part of the tradition talks about slaughtering animals, and and uh, clearly we are commanded uh, that if we have to slaughter animals, then we should do it with a sand. And what would that be with complete compassion and love and affection, and trying to make sure that there is minimal pain and suffering. Uh, so the second element of Ahsan is Rahmah. The third is Muhabba. This is very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran uh, that he loved us first. Uh, and so the people, there are those whom he loves and who love, back, love him back. And they are truly the Muslims, the people who have achieved the state of Ahsan. The fourth element of Ihsan is Murakhaba and with Muhasaba. Murakhaba and Muhasaba is a state of vigilance where you police yourself, where you look upon yourself and say, is what I'm doing the right thing? Is, if, if, is this policy that I have uh, promulgated, is this action that I have taken, is this idea that I am pursuing, is this something that will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So that is an important aspect uh, of becoming better, uh, ahsanu, to, to become more beautiful. Uh, and uh, the word ahsan itself is one about becoming more beautiful. And so the way you become more beautiful is through a process of self-criticism, self-vigilance. So you keep an, an eye on yourself. Uh, and imagine if we can translate this into public policy. Um, uh, you could create an institution uh, that is um, like uh, in the U.S. We have uh, offices that look at how people spend the money and are vigilant for, uh, to prevent corruption. So muraqaba in a public setting would be about uh, combating corruption and maintaining vigilance uh, to ensure that people who have power do not abuse their power. Uh, love is an important aspect uh, which can also be brought into public policy uh, where we try to build a society where people have respect for each other, mutual understanding and so the state should encourage a lot of interfaith, intercultural dialogues and for multicultural societies which have uh, people of different ethnicities, different races, different religions, it's very important to have a constant national level and local level dialogues which make people understand each other thereby increasing respect uh, and affection for each other. A society in which all citizens care for each other will be far more uh, resilient uh, to external threats and natural calamities than societies in which everyone is suspicious of each other. When it comes to mercy and rahmah you can think of it as compassionate society, a society which is forgiving. So for example, in the United States, uh, we have the system of parole where prisoners, if they behave themselves, are forgiven some of their punishments and they are allowed to go home earlier uh, than when than the amount of time they were supposed to spend in prison. That is a form of institutionalization of compassion and mercy and forgiveness. Uh, another form of forgiveness would be the the policy of dec declaring bankruptcy. It is also a po policy of forgiving debt. Uh, so some of these aspects of Ihsan are already implemented in some countries. Uh, and uh, I want to initiate discourses on how we can further implement them uh, in societies where Muslims or others would like to pursue uh, goodness, essentially, or, or have a society where everybody is trying uh, to, to do beautiful things. 
another aspect of Ihsan is husn or beauty, and I, I don't need to talk much about it. Uh, Muslims have tried to bring uh, husn in their societies through calligraphy, through architecture, uh, through poetry, uh, even through akhlaq. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said one of the special characteristics of his mission was to bring akhlaq to the society, uh, and we know that some of the segments of Muslim communities, akhlaq is is highly valued so so we have uh, this idea of beauty uh, uh, not only in material sense through beautiful architecture the Taj Mahal the Blue Mosque etc but also through music uh, through the poetry of uh, great poets like Rumi and Iqbal uh, and Ghalib uh, and then we also have uh, some art forms which are stunning Islamic uh, uh, art and um, and architecture. Then there are two other uh, elements of Ihsan that we need to focus on. One is Marifa or epistemology. Uh, and this is on the basis of a verse in the Quran, I argue that even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when you look at religious sources, when you look at the Quran, when you read the Quran, try to extract the most beautiful meaning from it. Try to extract the most beautiful meaning even from the text of the Quran. And, and uh, to me that was eye-opening. And I said, oh, the Quran itself recognizes um, that uh, alternative meanings can be drawn and some can be beautiful and others may not be as beautiful as the beautiful ones. Uh, and so as San then would, would encourage uh, us to look at sources, look at aspects. Uh, I mean, the idea of husn is done is also uh, an epistemological idea to make positive uh, assumptions about human nature uh, and society. And finally, the idea of fana. Uh, I mean, this is in Surah Al-Rahman. There is a discussion of kulluman alayha fan, everything that will exist perishes. Uh, and Sufis have uh, paid a lot of attention. Ultimately, this is the goal of the spiritual journey, the complete self-negation. But in terms of public policy and society, we are not here for a society to everybody to just give up pursuit of material power or wealth. But what Fana can do is uh, recognizing the virtue of self-negation would undermine the tensions that we experience today through identity politics. In identity politics, the goal is to assert oneself. I am so-and-so, we are so-and-so, we are the best, we are glorious, look at our past, look at our culture, look at our language, look at our history. So there is a, a continuous um, and at sometimes uh, uh, dysfunctional assertion uh, of an identity and distancing from other identi identities. Uh, and this often translates into nasty politics and might even lead to civil wars and ethnic conflicts. So the idea of Fana is to step back a little uh, and and uh, not to fully self-negate your group identity but not to assert it uh, in a vulgar and aggressive fashion and I think if in a society all groups were to pr practice some extent of self-negation and rather than just pursuing self-interest also think of other interests I think you will have a much virtuous society. So how does it all translate into politics? Uh, in the book, I look at the Prophet Muhammad governance of Medina for the last 10 years of his life. And I argue that there is a Medina model of governance, which is very different uh, from the model that most Islamic states like to implement. Uh, most Islamic states, uh, based on the theory of Khilafah, uh, try to emulate uh, the model that was practiced by the first four caliphs and often they ignore uh, the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu which is very clearly documented uh, in the last 10 years. Um, uh, it's a very complicated idea, uh, the idea of the Medina model, uh, but there are a few things I just wanted to point out. Uh, I think that there are three key elements uh, in the Medina model that is very important uh, and they can be the basis on which uh, a, a, a good modern Muslim state could operate. The three elements, I call them the three C's, are constitution, consultation, and consent. So the constitution 
that we get the idea of constitution clearly is a reference to the constitution of Medina, uh, which was also a social contract on the basis of which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became the, the de facto ruler of Medina. He did not crown himself king, but he was the ruler of Medina and all the, uh, the villages uh, and uh, small cities that surrounded the metropolis of Medina. Uh, and so his legitimacy came not from his religious authority, but from the consent that was given to him through the constitution of Medina. So that's an important part. So cons the constitution of modern society should have constitution. And the constitution of Medina was, was extremely inclusive uh, and also multi-religious. Uh, the constitution even uh, states very clearly uh, that uh, the tribes, uh, the non-Muslim tribes of Medina, including the Jewish tribes and the pagan tribes, were equal citizens of the state of Medina, having the same responsibilities, same duties, and same rights as Muslims. So in that sense, there is no distinction between a Muslim and a non-Muslim in the constitution of Medina. And if Muslim states today uh, were to, to copy this model, this Sunnah of Prophet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you will find that, um, the, that their uh, states will become more robust, more inclusive, and their minorities will also be, uh, will feel that they're part of the country and contribute to the country. The other processes are consent and consultation, which are, can be translated into becoming the basis uh, of a democracy or a democratic society where governance is based on the consent and consultation of its population. Finally, uh, there are certain shifts I, I want to recommend in Muslim thinking, this is very important, uh, which can help us uh, move away from the state, from the Islamic state, towards a state of Ahsan. Uh, and I like the fact that it is a pun. When you say state of Ahsan, I also mean Hal. State is state means government. State means hal. Uh, so the, the shift that I'm suggesting is the first shift that I've already talked about is to Muslims should stop thinking of the Khalif, Khalifa model, the Khilafa model, and to think more of the Medina model. Uh, and uh, that is important uh, because it adds uh, a much more stronger democratic uh, uh, ethos, uh, and it also provides uh, a basis for dealing with uh, diversity in society, both religious, uh, ethnic, and tribal. Uh, so I recommend, and in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that there is no better model for Muslims than Prophet Muhammad. The Sahaba were great, but if we have uh, the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, shouldn't we practice that than practicing the Sunnah of anybody else? So on that idea, the first shift I would like to do is the Muslims stop thinking so much about implementing the Khilafa model, which is based on Sharia and imposing Sharia on everybody else, but to think in terms of the Medina model and see how uh, the Prophet ﷺ governed with compassion and inclusivity, with Rahmah and mercy and love and so on, with all aspects of Asa. The second thing that I want to talk about is that Muslims should stop thinking about structure and focus on process. So when you focus on just structure, you're talking about government, the Islamic State. So you're talking about uh, just the distribution of power of society. But if you move away from thinking of government and move towards thinking about governance, about process, then it becomes where you start talking about how to do things. Uh, not so much as, okay, we have a Khalifa and not a president, and so we are an Islamic state. That, that really doesn't mean anything. In the end, what really matters is, are you, de are you delivering good governance or not? And I think if we focus more on good governance than the structure of the government, uh, and then adjust and twinkle uh, with the structure of the government in order to ensure that good governance is delivered, uh, then that would help us bring Ahsan into the process significantly because uh, good governance can also, the goodness that is in good governance can be Ahsan. Uh, I would like people to think more of national virtue rather than just national interest. And, in, and it would be great if Muslim societies, and not just Muslim societies, but all societies start thinking of national interest 
uh, with a heavy component of national virtues or developing national virtue. And, and I think most states tend to do that uh, when they are thinking of uh, investing in education of their population. So one way to develop a virtuous society is to provide uh, good education, and not just education for creating jobs, but education that builds good citizens, responsible citizens, citizens with values, uh, with tolerance for each other, uh, and citizens who uh, recognize the importance of goodness. And finally, uh, I want to suggest that we need to stop thinking about justice as a personal virtue. Every model of Islamic governance talks about we need to have a just ruler. I don't un even understand who is a just ruler. How do you determine whether a person is just? Uh, you only can determine by their actions. Uh, and that is an important thing. So if you want to judge whether an, an individual is, is informed by the values of justice, then look at their actions, look at their judgments, uh, and does it lead to a just outcome? And similarly, when we look at a society and a state, and you want to argue that this state pursues justice, then it should not be a pursuit or replication of a law from the 7th century or the 10th century, or celebrating an identity marker, but justice should be an outcome. If you look at a society and say, oh my God, there is a fantastic distribution of wealth. The Gini coefficient is so low for this society, which, by the way, for Indonesia is one of the better ones in the world. Uh, so if the Gini coefficient is low, it says that the distribution of wealth is pretty good. So there is some kind of economic distributive justice in this society. That is, after all, the purpose of zakat. So Muslims should start thinking about justice not as a personal virtue, but as a structural condition. So look at the society and say, well, these are the markers of, uh, of structural justice that we want to see. Is there equality? Is there equal distribution of wealth? Uh, uh, do everybody have equal recognition, etc.? So that is uh, a way of rethinking. So to summarize, what I have tried to do is basically uh, drawn your attention towards one of the most beautiful ideas in Islamic sources, which is Ahsan. Ahsanu inna Allaha yuhibbul muslimin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us all to do Ahsan uh, because he loves those who do Ahsan. Uh, and uh, I think that the time has come for Muslims to transcend real politics and to think beyond just the pursuit of power and wealth uh, and uh, in a collective sense uh, try to achieve uh, the perfection of the soul that is necessary uh, uh, to be a Muslim. Uh, we should try to govern as if we have made eye contact with God. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.